Welcome back to the Doctor is in Television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board certified plastic surgeon here in beautiful Monterey, California. I'm so very pleased you could join us today. I'm very pleased to have a very distinguished guest, a guest, Dr. Ronald Friedman, eye physician and surgeon, ophthalmologist. Dr. Friedman, thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. Dr. Friedman, before we get started and discussing cataracts and premium lenses, uh, let's talk a little bit about the training to become an ophthalmologist. How is it that you became an ophthalmologist? And let's just discuss briefly the difference, differences between an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, and an optician. Oh, that's, that's a 20-minute conversation in itself. Ophthalmologists are basically board-certified medical doctors that have gone through uh, college, uh, usually a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science degree. Then they go through four years of medical school. They do an internship in usually general medicine or other surgical uh, rotating specialties. And then there's a three-year residency to become a general ophthalmologist. Many ophthalmologists will go on after that and do a subspecialty year. Uh, all in all, it's about 12 years after you graduate from high school before you can hang your shingle up as an ophthalmologist. So, so, so in summary, an ophthalmologist is an eye physician and surgeon. Correct. Y you take care of medical and surgical diseases of the eye. Correct. Yes, right. and we're trained in general medicine. Un unlike an optometrist who, after going through college, goes to a special school of optometry and just st studies about prescribing glasses and the nature of eye diseases, but they are limited in what medicines they can prescribe and they can't do any surgery uh, in the state of California and in most other states. Okay. Opticians are just people who fit glasses. Okay, so, so, so they take care of the hardware and they get the glasses ready and they can do grinding of lenses and the spectacle adjustment and all that stuff. Correct. Okay, so in your practice, um, what are some of the conditions that you treat and take care of? I know we're going to talk about cataracts and we're going to talk more about premium, len premium lenses during cataract surgery, but what mm. type of conditions do you take care of in your practice? Well, like most general ophthalmologists, I see a lot of routine eye examinations and people who come for, for well exams uh, and to check for diabetes. Uh, but there are three big diseases that, that are prevalent in the geriatric population. I call them the big three, glaucoma, cataracts, and macular degeneration. And most of them have a very high prevalence over the age of 60, although they can have a, a younger onset. Uh, so on a daily basis, I see a half a dozen patients with glaucoma, uh, maybe a dozen patients with cataract, and maybe five or ten patients with macular degeneration. Okay. So, Dr. Friedman, before we get into the meat of our discussion and teaching, and I'm looking forward to this because I want to learn about this, can we briefly review the anatomy of the eyeball? I know what the, the very clear part on the mm -hmm. what we call the front of the eyeball, or the anterior part, that's the cornea. Correct. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's a type of lens, isn't that correct? Well, the best the, the best analogy for 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 the layperson is to look at the eye like it's a camera. A camera has a front part which is a lens, and then it has a back part which is the film of the camera. Uh, however, the eye is a little bit different. Most people would think that the the lens of the eye, which is in the middle of the eye, um, does most of the focusing, but it's actually the clear cornea, the window part right in front, that does most of the focusing for the eye. The lens of the eye, the part that becomes cataractus or cataract later in life, is, is a part that just fine tunes the focus. And then that brings light from infinity to focus on the retina, which then sends the, the signal to the brain. And the brain, of course, interprets the vision as we see. OK, so you said there are three big, I guess you said the big three, that there's cataracts, mm -hmm. and there's glaucoma, mm -hmm. and there's macular degeneration. Yes. So can we just briefly? describe each disease. So, so w w what's a Absolutely. cataract? Absolutely. Well, cataract is that lens of the eye that is the center part of the eye that focuses the, the light on the retina and fine-tunes it that becomes cloudy over time. And it, it does so because we as a human species have not evolved l enough to have that lens maintain its clarity throughout life. And that's in some ways not really a disease but just a normal aging process of the eye because if 85 to 90 percent of people will get cataracts by the time they're 90 we really can't consider it a disease but a normal aging change of the eye that we have to remedy. Glaucoma on the other hand is a disease where the pressure is elevated in the eye and causes damage to the optic nerve. 
and that's a very treatable condition with drops or surgery or laser, but must be diagnosed before significant damage is done, which is why routine examinations are important for everybody because there's no symptoms of glaucoma. You don't feel the pressure in the eye until the nerve is so sufficiently damaged that you've lost most of your vision. Now, macular degeneration, on the other hand, comes to the attention of the ophthalmologist r relatively quickly because it affects the reading vision, and usually someone will wake up one morning and notice that they can't see words clearly or there's distortion in their vision, and they come to the ophthalmologist or optometrist who diagnoses the fact that they have the onset of macular degeneration. So unlike glaucoma, which is insidious, and cataracts, which are slowly progressive, macular degeneration can be uh, more of a sudden onset. Okay, now is there any treatment for macular degeneration? Can that be treated or cured, or is that once it develops, it's just... Yes, there is treatment. There's, there's, there's two basic types of macular degeneration, which are um, classically called the wet type or the dry type. And the wet type, which uh, didn't have treatment for many years, has had fairly successful treatment over the last 10 or 15 years with uh, injections of uh, special ant uh, antimetabolites inside the eye. The dry macular degeneration is a slower progression and normally uh, responds uh, poorly to any treatment, although we use vitamin supplements and antioxidants to try and help the f retard the progression of the uh, loss of vision. Okay. Well, Dr. Friedman, we're going to have to bring you back on, on another opportunity to there's talk a lot about... Here. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to talk about. The eyeball is fascinating to me. We can talk about glaucoma another time. We can talk about macular degeneration another time. But what I'd like to talk about today for about the next 14 minutes mm -hmm. is the cataract. Mm -hmm. So again, let's review the anatomy. So the cornea that's the very clear part, that's the very front part of the eyeball. Correct. Most people would call it the colored part because they're seeing the iris through it and the cornea transmits the colored part of the iris, but it's actually perfectly clear throughout life. Okay, so the cornea is on the front of the right. eyeball, it's very clear. The colored part of the eye is called the iris and right behind the iris is that lens that focuses and fine-tunes the light from the outside world to the retina. Okay. So that lens, now is it true that the, that the that lens divides the anterior chamber from the posterior chamber of the eyeball? Uh, correct. The, the front segment of the eye we call the anterior chamber and the lens is right behind it and then behind the lens we call that the posterior segment or the posterior chamber of the eye where the, where the vitreous body, the jelly part of the eye, the largest part of the eye actually resides and then behind that is the retina, the film of the camera. Okay. So. A cataract, essentially, I think I heard you say just a couple of minutes ago, is when that lens mm -hmm. that's in between the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber, that lens so sort of gets cloudy or it Correct. degenerates, right? It's Correct. almost like a dirty windshield. Exactly, and that's how I describe it to patients. I say that the lens is like a dirty windshield, and unfortunately, I can't go inside your eye and clean the windshield. I have to replace the windshield, and that is the basics of what a cataract surgery or cataract procedure is. Okay, so when you operate on a person with cataracts, you, you actually you make an incision in the eyeball because mm -hmm. you've got to get in there. Yes. And, and Dr. Friedman, I, I think we need to correct something. So I've actually uh, heard some people think that the eyeball is removed and put on the operating room table and you operate no. on it and put it back in. But that's, that's a misconception. Correct. Right? So the eyeball, of course, stays within the socket. Absolutely. Okay. But you make an incision to be able to get in mm -hmm. and get the lens out. Correct. The, the dirty lens. Correct, the cloudy lens. And it's really an elegant procedure that's evolved over the last 40 years. In fact, we don't use any injections around the eye. We use a special jelly to numb the eye. We don't have to use any stitches when we, when we make the incision. And the incision is so small, it's approximately twice the thickness of a dime. And so it's, it actually seals itself right, at the, right wow. at the conclusion of the surgery. And the way we approach the lens and get the cloudy lens out is with an ultrasonic probe. Most people confuse that with a laser, but a laser cannot remove a cataract. A laser can be used in certain aspects of cataract surgery, but the cataract has to be removed through a small incision with an ultrasonic probe called phaco emulsification. And this is the standard of care throughout the United States and most of the free world. Okay, so step one is you've got to get access to the cataract or that cloudy lens, the dirty windshield, and you've got to get that out. Correct. And that's with FACO. Right. Right. 
So we suck the cloudy part of the lens in and then we, it leaves a sack where that was and we have to put another lens to replace it because without it, the eye will not have that ability to fine tune the light from the outside world to get it to appear on the retina. And that's where implant technology comes in. Okay, so, so you need to, this is incredible to me. So you remove that dirty, cloudy lens mm -hmm. and you insert a brand new man-made lens. Correct. Right. Is it glass? Is it plastic? It no, it's, it, it, it looks like a contact lens and it's, it's foldable so that we can fold it up and, 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 and push it through a very small hole and then it unfolds in the eye. Uh, it's, it's made of a high index of refraction plastic, I, uh, mostly, mostly silicone or, or combination of silicone, silicone and acrylate. Uh, it's got very, very high resolution. In fact, the resolution is better than the natural lens, so most people after a cataract operation feel that they've got a high definition eye. Well that's incredible. Okay, so once you get that lens, that new lens into place, do it, does it stay there by itself? Do you have to sew it in place? Does it have No, it, it has it has little um, haptics or, or feet on it that, that suspend themselves in the sack where the natural lens was. Uh, I wish I had you know brought some pictures to show this because it's it's it it's, it's all over the internet anyway, but it, it suspends itself in the same sack that God put the natural lens. So in a sense, we're only taking the cloudy part of the lens out, leaving the sack, and putting a foldable lens that opens up inside the sack. And it steadies itself, and it fuses in that sack for the remainder of one's life. Well, that's incredible. So d does that lens allow a person to focus as well as they could before they got a cataract? Uh, well, most of the focus for up close is lost by the time someone would have cataract surgery anyway because we all lose our up close focus with age and require reading glasses. And this is where the different types of lenses have come on the market in the last uh, several years. Most implant technology is a fixed focus lens. So it will only have one focus point and that usually would be for distance. And someone would be required to wear glasses for their near vision or their mid-range vision if they have that fixed focus lens set for distance. Okay, so, so our own lens that we're born with uh, is able to focus, it, it, it really fine tunes the image to right. the back of the retina. Now, do you call that accommodation? Or yes, that's accommodation, and, and we lose most of it by the time we're 65. So if, if, if you were born with good vision for distance, you go into reading glasses usually in your mid-40s or late-40s, and the reading glasses get progressively stronger, and then about age 65, you've reached the maximum of, of that loss of accommodation or focus. Okay. So you replace the, our own natural lens mm -hmm. with a man-made lens. Correct. And... So now teach me more about, so, so you put in a lens and it's really, a f it's a fixed lens. Correct. Uh, like it doesn't adjust itself for if you're reading up closely or, or you're Correct. watching them harvest wheat in Kansas or something, no, right? No, we don't have that technology and that's why we have other uh, approaches to, to simulating uh, the, the kind of focus that one may have had in their youth. And this is where multifocal lenses uh, come into play one of the three different types of what we call premium lenses that are available in conjunction with cataract surgery. Okay, so as an option for a patient who's having a cataract operation, mm -hmm. they can have, essentially it's a single focused or single focal length lens Correct. put in. Yes. Is that what we call maybe the standard approach? Or? Standard lens. Okay, mm -hmm. so then there's a premium lens, so Correct. they can select. Right, and there's three different there are three different a la carte options that one has because in addition to correcting the f close vision with an accommodating or a multifocal lens, we have lenses that can correct for astigmatism because that's another focus abnormality of the eye. And, and we can offer that type of lens in addition to the ability to have a more natural focus lens. Okay, so Dr. Friedman, I, I want to learn about this and get clear no pun intended. Mm -hmm. so, so astigmatism, isn't that a distortion of, of the cornea? Correct. Front? It is. It is a, it, the astigmatism is where the, the 
cornea, which has most of the focus power of the eye, is shaped more like a football than a basketball. So it requires a special lens to correct that, what we call defocus or irregularity in the focus. And many people who have astigmatism have worn glasses their whole life. And this is an option during cataract surgery to actually correct that astigmatism with the use of uh, a premium lens called a astigmatic or toric lens. So that's for astigmatism. Correct. And okay. it can also be added to the multifocal lens. So you can correct the astigmatism, and you can also uh, get a lens that has increased depth of focus. So it more naturally simulates the kind of focus that you might have had before you turned 45 years of age. Well, well, that's incredible. So, so l let's, uh, let's see. We don't have a lot of time left. We've got about six minutes left. So let's talk about that selection process. Um, these premium lenses, mm -hmm. th there are a number of options. And I'm, I'm certain that you or your office staff discusses the options that available to a patient before surgery. Yes. Like a patient doesn't have to decide on the operating room table. No, they can't. We, the lens has to be ordered in advance. So they have to, uh, they have to decide you know, well in advance. And when, a, when we decide a patient needs cataract surgery, we give them a second appointment where we measure the eye. We do what's called biometry. And we look at the eye in terms of topography for astigmatism. And then we assist them in what we call the lens selection. And that visit is called the lens selection appointment. And it is standard of care uh, in the United States to at least offer patients these premium products, even though they are an out-of-pocket expense that are not covered by any insurance companies. It is still standard of care because many people will see their friends in their community that have them and would, would be very unhappy if they were at least not given the option to have the benefits of these uh, what's called advanced technology lenses. Okay, so a person has the option of selecting a premium lens, say to, to correct some astigmatism, right. um, to give them a better ability to focus on up close, mm -hmm. you know, like reading yeah. glass, as well as to see in the distance. Is yes. that correct? Yes. So, so uh, Dr. Freeman, in summary, I think you said there are three different general options. Is that yes. right? Yes. Well, we have the astigmatism lens that corrects the astigmatism. Right. And then we have one that's called an accommodating lens, which gives a little bit of focus, but not a lot of focus. That one's called the crystal lens. And then there is two different types on the market of what's called the multifocal lens. And they have become more popular the, uh, of, of all the different types because they can provide more adequate reading vision without glasses than the, than the other types. Okay. So l let's, talk about a little, let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of it. So you said that ahead of time, a person will have a lens selection <laughs> visit, mm -hmm. and that way they can, you can tell them, I advise you to consider an astigmatic lens or something that's going to accommodate it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and then they can make a selection. Mm -hmm. So is the process the same? I, I think you said that it's not covered by regular insurance. Is that correct? Correct. OK. So, so they'll pay something extra, but mm -hmm. they'll get an upgrade in the lens. Yes. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, about the mechanics of the, the cataract operation. Do people have to go to sleep? Is it under local? Is it outpatient? Is it general anesthetic? Is the rest of the procedure covered by insurance? What's the recovery period? Like, what do you tell your patients? Uh, when they come in for the lens selection appointment, I'll tell them that, that the procedure is going to take 15 minutes. We don't use any local anesthesia. We put a, a, a jelly, a topical jelly, uh, xylocaine 4% jelly on the eye, which provides adequate anesthesia for the 15-minute procedure. They do receive some sedation, uh, usually a little bit of Dipravan or Versed, just light sedation because we don't want them asleep. We want them to be able to cooperate uh, to, a, to a small degree. Okay, l l let me interrupt for one moment. Do you have an anesthesiologist there present? Yes. To, to, okay, so an anesthesiologist is present mm -hmm. to help sedate the patient, yes. to give some of the sedatives and mm -hmm. narcotics, et cetera, through the vein, through the IV. Right. And you, you take care of numbing up the eyeball. Correct. Okay. So the patient's not asleep, but they're sedated. Yes. And the eyeball of is numb, Correct. so they're comfortable. Right. And okay. it's actually a music and light show, because I always play music in the operating room, as you know, since I am a, a musician. That's right. And, and with the lights and the music, it's not an unpleasant experience, and it's only 15 minutes. And they go home, the eye is covered for a couple hours, and then they resume taking their eye drops. The day of the procedure, the eye is very bright 
and, uh, but unfocused. And as the day goes on, they continue taking eye drops, the comfort improves, and they start to develop the focus and the high definition vision that we are hoping to have them achieve. Well, th that's incredible, Dr. Friedman. So it takes about 15 minutes. Correct. It's outpatient. Yes. It's done under sedation and some local, topical right. local. Mm -hmm. now, now, what about uh, activity? Can they play basketball the next day? Can they golf? Like well, most of the patients are, you know, are over 65, so they're, they're probably not going to want to play basketball. But we do get asked a lot about golf, golf and, and, and tennis, walking right, and, and driving. Right. And they can drive the next day. Uh, they can't drive the day of the procedure because they're given sedation and they had one of their eyes operated on, so it's not a good idea to drive the day of the procedure. The next day they can drive themselves for their post-operative visit. They can take a, you know, a two, three mile walk. I allow patients to resume more strenuous activities about four days after the procedure. Okay. Well, Dr. Friedman, I think this is just fascinating. I'm amazed that you guys actually operate inside the eyeball and improve someone's vision. And now that they're now that available to patients, we have what you call premium lenses mm -hmm. or kind of an upgraded lens. Um, what I'd like to do, we just have a few seconds left. Do you have a, a phone number or website contact information? I want to say this is Ronald Friedman, mm -hmm. uh, ophthalmologist here in Monterey, California. Right. We call ourselves the Friedman Eye Center. Friedman Eye Center. And our our phone number is three seven five two four eight six. And we do have a website that is www.friedmani.com. Okay, I want to repeat that. So it's 831-375-2486. Yes. Dr. Ronald Friedman, ophthalmologist, eye physician and surgeon in Monterey, California. Dr. Friedman, this is fascinating to me. I'd be delighted if you come on the program again and talk about the other of the big three. Yeah. There's glaucoma <laughs> and there's macular degeneration, right? Yeah. So we've just sort of scratch the surface, surface about one of the big three or common eye conditions or diseases. Great. Dr. Ronald Friedman, ophthalmologist, thanks very much for being here. My pleasure. Once again, I'm Dr. David Morwood. I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon here in beautiful Monterey, California. This is the Doctor Is In television program. We're going to take a very brief pause for a very good cause. Hello, I'm Dr. David Morwood. I have over 25 years experience in plastic surgery. Here in California, we all love the outdoors. Golf, tennis, going to the beach. However, the sun can play havoc with the delicate skin on the back of the hands and neck. Call or click today to learn the newest methods for restoration and beautification of the hands, neck, and other areas affected by the sun. Hello, I'm Dr. David Morwood. I have over 25 years experience in plastic surgery. One of the common goals I share with my patients is that they look natural after their facial rejuvenation. Dr. Morwood made me feel really comfortable. His staff is phenomenal. Going into his office is always a great experience. Call or click today to learn how our combined approach of art and science can enhance your natural beauty. Hello, I'm Dr. David Morwood. I have over 25 years experience in plastic surgery. A smooth, firm neckline is a universal sign of beauty in both women and men. Dr. Morwood not only helped me regain my confidence, he helped me achieve the best version of me. Call or click today to learn how the natural neck lift can rejuvenate your beautiful neck and jawline. Welcome back to the Doctor Is In television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon right here on the beautiful coast, the central coast of California. Thanks very much for being here. In this next segment, what I'd like to do is talk about how to make decisions when you're considering breast augmentation. This is a very uh, big topic. It's somewhat complicated. But what I'd like to do is make an effort to simplify the process of making the proper decision for yourself when you want to have bigger, fuller, rounder breasts that are a little bit higher. That's what breast augmentation does for you. So I think it's, this would be a good idea to review the pros and cons of breast augmentation in general. So let's start with the advantages of breast augmentation. And as you know, you've heard me say in the past, 
Everything we do in plastic surgery, as in life, has advantages and disadvantages. There are pros and cons, there are positives and negatives. So, the positives to breast augmentation. In one day, safely, you get to be bigger, fuller, rounder, and a little bit higher. I'll, I'll say that again. Breast augmentation gives you breasts that are bigger, fuller, rounder, and a little bit higher. Now, before I talk about the potential downsides and negatives of breast augmentation, for a woman who needs to be a lot higher, then she should consider a breast lift or a mastopexy. Now, before I go on, I want to emphasize, I said that breast augmentation uh, leads to or gives you breasts that are bigger, fuller, rounder, and a little bit higher. If you need to be, need or want to be a lot higher, that's a breast lift. Sometimes we do breast lift or mastopexy at the same time as breast augmentation. That's called augmentation mastopexy. Sometimes we do them at separate times. Uh, if a woman is not sure whether, whether or not she's going to get enough of a lift with breast augmentation, I'll oftentimes recommend to her that we delay. Sometimes we can do a breast lift right in the office under a local block. Uh, but if a woman, let's say she's breastfed quite a bit or she's lost a lot of weight or she just has sort of a congenital or familial tendencies to droopy breasts, um, that's called ptosis. That's, a, that's the plastic surgeon's way to describe a droopy breast or a floppy breast or in someone who's lost a lot of volume, the breast can hang. And just briefly, sometimes women are born that way. They're just born with extra skin, they lack volume, and so the breasts are droopy. So I talked about the advantages, I listed them, of breast augmentation surgery, bigger, fuller, rounder, and a little bit higher safely in one day. Now what are the downsides? The downsides to breast augmentation are when we use implants, uh, I guarantee to women that the edge of the implant can be felt. Now, certainly some breast implants are more difficult to feel than others. For example, when silicone implants are used and they stay soft, they're very difficult to distinguish between breast tissue or, or flesh and the breast implant. Saline or salt water filled implants are a little easier to feel. But the truth is, is that I want you to learn how to feel the edge of the implant because self breast exams are important for every woman, even women who have breast augmentation. So I tell all women that the edge of the implant can be felt and I want you to learn how to do that. I want you to learn to be able to feel your own breast and tell what the implant is and tell what, let's say you develop a lump or a leak or you get a cyst or something. We want you to be able to find that on self breast exams. Now, so breast implants can be felt. They can, the outline can sometimes be seen and there are ways we can lessen that. Uh, there can be infection, extrusion, migration. There can be a change in nipple sensation. Approximately 15% approximately of women nationwide after breast augmentation can have increased sensation in the nipple and decreased sensation in the nipple, or, or decreased sensation in the nipple. Now, in my practice, almost all women uh, wake up uh, numb. I give them a lot of very dilute numbing fluid. I want them to be comfortable when they wake up. So they have decreased sensation right away, and that lasts for about six weeks. And then most of the patient, most of my patients, they have normal sensation that returns. Uh, I should mention that the fourth intercostal nerve is the big nerve that supplies nipple areola complex reconstruction, uh, excuse me, nipple areola complex sensation. The nipple, we all know that the areola is the tan part around the nipple. That's the fourth intercostal nerve that comes from the side, goes, goes uh, up uh, under the skin to the nipple areola complex. That provides sensation. We look for that. I look for that during dissection. I'm a trained microsurgeon. We oftentimes will brush it aside so a woman will be temporarily numb, but it's possible for her to have numbness, possible for her to have increased uh, sensation. So I mentioned a guarantee the implant can be felt. Sometimes the outline can be seen. There can be infection, extrusion, migration, change in nipple sensation. Implants can leak. Um, and it's important that a woman is aware that she'll have to do self-breast exams and possibly uh, have special uh, tests like an MRI for silicone breast implants in five years. Now, I do want to mention the single most common side effect or complication with breast augmentation, the possible downsides, and that is 
capsular contracture. What's capsular contracture? It's important to clarify that any time we place a foreign material in the body, whether that foreign material is a heart valve or a knuckle replacement or a, <laughs> or a breast implant, the body makes a normal scar tissue around that implant or foreign material. And that's normal, that's natural, and it's healthy. Capsular contracture is that phenomena or process that occurs when that normal scar tissue or the capsule becomes thick and heavy and starts to squeeze and contract. Now, it's true that the implant itself doesn't change, but that constriction and that, that squeezing, that scar tissue, makes the implant feel hard and oftentimes it makes it look distorted. Now, here's some more information for you. There are stage one, two, three, and four. Stage one capsule is something that everybody gets. Everybody gets the normal soft scar around a breast implant. A stage two co contracture is when the breasts look normal, but they feel firm. A stage three contracture is where not only does the breast feel firm, but there's a change in the appearance. It can look a little distorted. Now, stage four is when there's constitutional symptoms. In other words, when it's cold, a woman, a woman might feel uncomfortable. If she goes on an airplane, she might feel some discomfort. In other words, there's some discomfort um, that's kind of bothersome or symptomatic to her. As that scar tissue is getting thick and heavy and squeezing, a woman can have constitutional symptoms. So that's grade one, two, three, and four. That's capsular contracture. That's the single most common complication or side effect with breast augmentation surgery. Now, recall that I said breast augmentation with implants, there are these advantages. Now, it's important that also that I mention there's another way to do breast augmentation where we don't use breast implants is that is, and that is with a woman's own tissue, her own fat. How does that work? That's sometimes called the natural way to do breast augmentation. It's really autologous fat transfer. That's kind of a fancy way to say that we take your own fat cells and move them to your breast to make your breast bigger, fuller, rounder, and a little bit higher. I sometimes do this type of fat grafting to the buttocks. Some people call that the, the Brazilian butt lift. I do a lot of fat grafting to the cheekbones to give a woman higher cheekbones again or to the mandibular angle, sometimes bring the chin forward, sometimes to fill in some lines. It's not a great treatment for wrinkles, but it certainly can add volume and it can bring estrogen receptors, can bring additional vascularity, uh, et cetera. So that's fat grafting. Can this be done for breast augmentation? Yes, but in general, what I tell women is that breast augmentation with your own fat will in general lead to a modest or moderate improvement in the size and lead you to be fuller and rounder. If you're looking for a more robust or a more dramatic change, in general that is the use of implants. So there are pros and cons to each of course. Uh, the advantage is if you do fat grafting for breast augmentation there's no foreign material. But it's more of an operation. You only get a moderate or minimal, I shouldn't say minimal, but a moderate increase in size. However, uh, not all of the fat will survive. Some of it calcifies, and you need a radiologist, a breast radiologist that's very experienced. When you do self-breast exams, if you, noticed, if you notice anything, oftentimes you'll need a workup. Uh, when you get a mammogram, you'll need a experienced breast radiologist to distinguish uh, between a dangerous calcification and just a regular uh, calcification from some of the fat that did not survive. So that's an introduction to the pros and cons of breast augmentation. Now, I said I wanted to talk about making good decisions for yourself to help tilt the balance in your favor. In other words, we want to tilt the balance towards being bigger, fuller, rounder, and a little bit higher, and away from having the implants be able to be felt or seen or develop capsule contracture or have infection, extrusion, migration, change in nipple sensation, uh, et cetera. I mentioned leaking and of course there's special surveillance. Now, what are some of the decisions that we can make? There are two personal decisions to be made 
and there are lots of other m sort of mechanical decisions to be made that I can help with. But essentially there are two decisions to be made for a woman and, and basically they are personal decisions. I can help, but the first decision for you to make is roughly what size you want to be. Keep in mind that we cannot predict cup size. None of the bra manufacturers have a consistent way to measure the cup size. Playtex is different than Cross Your Heart, is different from uh, Victoria's Secret, Secret is different from Johnson Johnson. There's no consistent way to measure cup size. In fact, in about a two year period, Victoria's Secret changed the way they measure cup size two or three times. So we simply cannot guarantee any cup size. However, what I find helpful in my practice is if a woman comes in and tells me what cup size she wears now, I will ask her in rough terms, what cup size would you like to be? So that can help me get an idea. So the first personal decision to make is roughly what size you want to be. Now we have something called the biodimensional approach where we do pretty sophisticated measurements. We can do the vector imager. And so using those images, in summary, we offer you small, medium, large augmentation, or extra large. And you can use these descriptive terms and we can help you choose a breast size. We, we order them in CCs and we order them in dimensions, custom designed for you, well custom chosen for you based on what you would like. So that's the first personal decision. The other decision to make is silicone or, sa excuse me, silicone or saline. It's a personal decision. Uh, just briefly, this is not a complete list, but silicone in general feels more like flesh. Uh, silicone is more durable, it lasts longer, it leaks less often. We used to tell women that silicone has more capsular contracture than saline, but I don't think that's true anymore. There's about, it be, depending on the study, between a 6% and 30% chance of symptomatic capsular contracture and breast augmentation. So silicone and saline, uh, silicone feels more like flesh in general. It's, more, it's certainly more durable. The big downside to silicone is if you leak, you will likely on that day to have a silent leak or a silent rupture. You won't know it right away. Now saline, that's an implant filled with salt water. If a saline implant leaks, you know it within a day or two because it goes flat. In fact, we call it, that's a flat. The, silic the saline just leaks out and it's into your bloodstream and you'll probably pass your water quite a bit for a day or two and you just deflate and there's no question about the safety. The downside with saline is it doesn't feel as much as flesh as silicone. Maybe it doesn't look as natural as silicone. And there's no, there's no question about, this, about the safety. Saline is just what's in, your, uh, what's in your bloodstream. It's just salt water. In fact, it's normal saline. Uh, they're a little bit less durable. However, they're a little bit less expensive than silicone implants. Finally, uh, I think that saline implants have a little bit of an advantage because I can make a little bit smaller incision to get the saline implant in. It comes empty and so I can insert it rolled up or deflated and then once we get it into the position then we can inflate it. Silicone comes inflated so we need to make a slightly smaller incision to get the implant in. So. Silicone and saline, that's one of the big choices. Now, there are four different incisions to be made underneath the, the breast fold, underneath the areola, that's the tan part, through the armpit. Now, there's another incision that can we make or approach that is not totally accepted by the manufacturers, and that's through the umbilicus or through the belly button. It's not totally accepted by the manufacturers because it has to be rolled up and placed in a metal tube and sort of dissected up and that's called the tuba, trans umbilical augmentation, breast augmentation. Sometimes the implant can be damaged and I, not all the manufacturers will back that with the warranty. So there's four different incisions. We can go above the muscle and under the muscle. There are advantages and disadvantages to that. Going above the muscle gives you more of a lift. Some people think that's where the breast belongs anyway, anatomically on top of the muscle. However, if we go under your muscle, it's a little more protected, it's harder to feel, it's harder to see. However, if you're a weightlifter and you do a lot of weights and you exercise your pectoralis a lot or you, let's say you water ski, there'll be something called an animation deformity where the muscle will distort 
the breast mound. But what I tell women is if, if you're a weightlifter or you're very athletic and you contract your pectoralis muscles, even if you didn't have an augmentation, you're going to have some change in the position and shape of the breast. That's just normal, natural. There's teardrop, there's round, there's, I mentioned, uh, saline and silicone. There's another choice to be made, and that's textured uh, versus smooth. All the shells of the breast augmentation are made of silicone. Textured is like it sounds. It's a little bit rough, and we can have a very aggressive texturing, or, or we can have kind of a semi-smooth, semi-textured surface, or it can be completely glistening smooth. In my practice, I would say I rarely use textured breast implants anymore. There's a slight risk. It's not common, but there is a type of lymphoma or T-cell proliferation that is only found with textured, excuse me, textured breast implants. I tend to like the feel of smooth, uh, round silicone implants. I don't think that the teardrop or textured implants tend to g really give it any big advantage. The teardrop shaped implants or sort of gummy, gummy bear, many of my patients find that they feel a little bit firm. And most women want a supple, soft bosom. So I feel in general, smooth round silicone uh, is advantageous for a woman. Now, if a woman wants saline, that's fine too. That comes in a smooth uh, surface. In general, if we're going to use saline implants, I put them under the muscle. In general, if a woman chooses silicone implants, we can go either position, above the muscle or under the muscle, typically above the muscle with silicone implants. Now, why do I sometimes recommend to a woman to go under the muscle? If she has very thin soft tissue coverage, if she has thin skin, a thin subcutaneous layer, and very little breast tissue, if we put that implant right under the breast tissue on top of the muscle, it's more likely to be able to be felt and perhaps seen. If we go under the muscle, there's a lot more tissue in between the implant itself and your fingertips, or there's a, and of course, there's a lot more tissue in between the implant itself and being able to see. There's a lot more tissue between the implant and your eye and what you, and what you can uh, distinguish and, and tell that's there. So again, I review the pros and cons of breast augmentation, whether it's with the use of implants, or a woman's own fat. We can talk a, for a long time about fat grafting for breast augmentation or buttock augmentation. And I spoke about some of the decisions to be made, textured, smooth, round, teardrop shaped, almost unlimited sizes. I can help you with those decisions. But of course, uh, there are two personal decisions for you to choose between silicone and saline or give us an idea roughly of what size you like to be. Of course, I can help you make those decisions as well, but I think it's a custom designed approach based on your size. Do you need a lift? Are we going to go above the muscle, under the muscle? Are you athletic? Do you exercise your pectoralis muscles a lot? Are we going with saline, silicone, textured, smooth, etc.? What incision to be made? So there's all kinds of decisions to be made to custom design an approach for you to help us ensure or at least give us a big chance the highest chance possible that you'll be satisfied with your silhouette and your breast augmentation. If you have any further questions or you're interested in breast augmentation or any issue in plastic and reconstructive surgery, I hope you will call my office, Dr. David Morwood. I'm here on the Central Coast in California, 831-646-8661, or go to my website, www.drmorwood.com. That's D-R. M-O-R-W-O-O-D. Once again, I'm Dr. David Morwood. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon here in beautiful Monterey, California. This is the Doctor Is In program. We're going to take a very brief pause for a very good cause. It's scary making the, the decision to have um, reconstructive surgery, but it's so worth what you get out of it. I'm stress free. I know I'm not gonna get breast cancer. Everything is back to normal, and it really did not take long to bounce back. I have a, a sense of hope for other women that this surgery can help them to live normal lives. This year, more than 200,000 women in this country will be diagnosed with breast cancer. For many of them, a mastectomy, or removal of the affected breast, will be recommended as part of the cancer treatment. The idea of losing a breast for some women can be almost as difficult as being diagnosed with breast cancer. 
modern breast reconstruction can help. The purpose of this presentation is to provide women with valuable information about the major issues in breast reconstruction. We'll have an opportunity to speak with women who chose different methods of reconstruction. We'll talk to experts in the field of breast cancer and we'll let you know your options for breast reconstruction. I embraced the mastectomy and reconstruction procedure and because of that I had a terrific outcome and it's changed my life in a positive way. For the thousands of women who will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year, we understand this is most likely a troubling and frustrating time. We hope this presentation has been valuable to you and will help you make some very difficult decisions that you're facing. Welcome back to the Doctor Is In television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board certified plastic surgeon here on the beautiful central coast of California. Thank you very much for being here. I'm delighted to talk for the next few minutes, this will be a short segment, on choosing the proper treatment for your facial rejuvenation. There is a, a really a tremendous growth these days in med spas and non-invasive treatments for facial rejuvenation and minimally invasive treatments for facial rejuvenation and of course we still have what we call facelifts and neck lifts and plastic surgery for the face and neck and eyelids etc. So what I'd like to do is just give you a capsule summary and briefly as I said of how we distinguish between minimally invasive and non-invasive and then surgery for facial rejuvenation. First of all Non-invasive treatments are things like uh, skin care or some of the light lasers like IPL or BBL and some of the, some of the lasers that don't penetrate be between, uh, excuse me, don't penetrate under the dermis. Uh, facials, I, be I believe in facials by estheticians. Um, they can improve the health of the skin. Estheticians are great at teaching you how to take care of the skin. In other segments, we've outlined the key steps to skin care, and that's uh, properly cleansing and exfoliating and regenerating, and of course, avoiding smoking, avoiding the sun, uh, using sunblock, uh, stimulating, regenerating, etc. So, those are key steps to skin care, and those are non invasive. Now, they can be very helpful uh, BBL or broadband light, uh, IPL, intense pulse light, that can be very helpful. Now, um, minimally invasive, I consider procedures like Botox injections, fillers. Uh, some types of microliposculpture I consider minimally invasive. Uh, that's where I just have to make very minimal uh, access incisions to put in a cannula. It's almost like a big needle to suction out fat and to mold and shape and tailor. So they can be very effective minimally invasive procedures, as I said, Botox and fillers. Fillers are things like Bellotero, Voluma, Juvederm, you pop, perhaps remember the old uh, collagen uh, for lip injections, uh, etc. Those are minimally invasive. The advantages are they're essentially lunchtime treatments uh, where there's minimal downtime. There can be some bruising and swelling. Um, they can certainly be effective. I'm a big believer in Botox around the eyes. We can soften glabellar furrows, we can soften squinting lines or smile lines. Uh, I can give you a minimal elevation of the lateral brow. It's not as effective or dramatic as a surgical brow lift, but certainly I can give you a little bit of elevation uh, with, a mic with a Botox micro brow lift. Uh, fillers, I'm a big believer in fillers for certain indications. I think Voluma is a heavy filler that goes in general down deep on the bone. I put it deeper uh, deeper in the tissue. I think it's great for augmentation of the cheekbones. Sometimes we can bring the chin forward a little bit. We can increase the mandibular angle prominence. Uh, fine fillers like Bellotero are good for under the eyelids. That eyelid cheek junction or tear trough, I think it's good for fine lines of the lips. I think it's good for a lip augmentation to make the lips a little bit more plumper to accent the vermiculitaneous border. So those are what I call minimally invasive 
uh, treatments. Now, there are lunchtime treatments. There's minimal uh, downside in terms of very low risk of infection, almost no risk of bleeding. I should mention there have been some reported cases where filler would get into a vessel that leads to the eyeball and that causes some vision problems or loss of vision. I should mention that. There have been some cases reported around the world. We certainly are cognizant of that, are very careful. There are ways to minimize uh, the chance of that happening. But those are what I call minimally invasive treatments. There's, in general, lower risk, in general, less money, in general, hardly any downtime. You can have them done at lunch and you can go back to work in the afternoon. Sometimes there's bruising and swelling. Uh, but there's very little, very little downtime. Now, surgery, of course, that's clearly the most powerful treatment that we have for facial rejuvenation. Uh, surgery, of course, can lead to dramatic results. Uh, however, there are potential downsides as compared to non-invasive treatments and minimally invasive treatments. Anytime we make an incision, there's a scar, permanent visible scars. Now, of course, Plastic surgeons, we're so concerned with scars and appearance. We do our best to minimize scars. We try to disguise them. We place the scars within natural creases. Uh, we close very carefully, of course, but scars can be unpredictable. The, perhaps the greatest predictor for the quality of a scar, there really are two, where it's made and your own innate healing ability. Some people just plain make heavy scars, other, other people make scars that are almost invisible. It's a lot related to what we call the Fitzpatrick uh, grade of your skin. In general, people from the very northern Scandinavian countries, fair, blonde, blue-eyed, make minimal scars in general. And people with deeply pigmented skin, with very dark skin from Africa or dark skin Hispanics, in general, they make heavier scars. I would say the exception to those rules are some people from Ireland. Uh, make keloids. Those are very heavy scars. But in general, scars are unpredictable, but every, every time we make an incision, it leaves a scar. So surgery is the most powerful tool we have for facial rejuvenation, but it can be certainly the most expensive. Every time there's a need for downtime, minimally, you've got to rest for three days and three nights, not lay in bed, but take it easy for th at home for three days and three nights. On day four, in general, we tell you to, to have a little more activity, but don't get your blood pressure up on day 11. You slowly get back to your life. It's certainly the most powerful. It can be the most expensive. There is some risk of bleeding, bad scars, infection, uh, loss of skin, nerve damage, numbness, crooked smile, etc. So I think it's important to put those different categories into these groups of minimally invasive treatments that can do a little bit for you, but in general, the changes are subtle. They're less expensive. Um, much, much lower risk. Then there's minimally invasive procedures like Botox and fillers and possibly microliposculpture. Um, medium range for prices. You need a little bit of downtime, not much, but a little bit of downtime, perhaps more expense. And then, of course, the most powerful tool we have is surgery, and there are some attendant risks. So I think it's important when you consult to see a nurse, dermatologist, plastic surgeon who is experienced. I'm a big believer in board certification. See someone who is experienced in cosmetics and aesthetic surgery and help you to make a decision, help you to come to a custom designed approach for you because really what we want is to help you achieve your goals. If you have any questions about minimally invasive procedures, our medical spa, uh, um, non-invasive procedures or plastic surgery of the face or any other body, I hope you'll call my office, Dr. David Morwood here on the Central Coast of California, 831-646-8661, or go to my website, drmorwood.com, drmorwood.com. Once again, I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon here in beautiful Monterey, California. Thank you very much. Michael Martins in the control booth. This is the Doctor is in Television program. Thank you very much for joining us.